Creating a literary festival is always special. It's always different, with each being a journey of creation, a response to our world. This year has been like none other, highlighting what it means to be human and the joys and comfort found in shared experiences. As readers, we turn to books to find solace, strength, inspiration and understanding. The authors we explore are documenting the stories of our times and helping us gain a better understanding of where the world might go next. The power of reading and the need for connection and community has inspired the 41st edition of the Toronto International Festival of Authors. And I welcome you warmly to share in this festival and our celebration of stories. Buy a book, discover new ideas, and share them with friends. Dive into this year's festival and enjoy hundreds of virtual events. Consider donating to the festival, if you can, to help support our free program and to help us continue to support writers. Ask big questions and bring people together as we attempt to bring our new world into focus. We respectfully acknowledge that words and ideas have been shared on this land for thousands of years. The land on which we operate has been occupied by the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. It is part of the Dish with One Spoon territory and is still home to many indigenous people. We pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Even as we gather virtually, in many cases from the comfort of our own homes, as I'm doing right now, I think it's important that we continue to acknowledge the history of the land that we think of as home and thank those who have cared for the land and are sharing it with us. We are grateful to be here connecting with others in the celebration of stories. Hello, and welcome to the 41st edition of the Toronto International Festival of Authors, Canada's largest and longest running literary festival. My name is Emily Donaldson. I'm a freelance books columnist and the editor of Canadian Notes and Queries magazine. And I'll be chairing tonight's event uh, titled Entanglements, featuring authors Sidura Ludwig and Maria Reva, who are popping up right now. Hi, Maria and Sidura. Hi. Uh, both Maria and Sidura have written books of interlinked stories with themes of community and of lives intertwi intertwined during periods of major historical and social change something I think we can all relate to at the moment, uh, especially in this, our Hollywood Squares reality uh, being a case in point. Um, Sidura Ludwig's book, You Are Not What We Were Expecting, looks at the tensions that build within a multi-generational Jewish community in contemporary Thornhill, Ontario, while Maria Reva's book, Good Citizens Need Not Fear, takes a humorous, absurdist angle while exploring the lives of inhabitants of a crumbling high-rise in 1980s Soviet-era Ukraine. Uh, so in terms of the format of tonight's program, both authors are going to read for a couple of minutes, um, after which we're gonna have a 20-minute discussion. Uh, and then after that, we'll open up the panel to audience questions, uh, which you can access through the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but please don't hesitate to submit questions as we go along uh, whenever you think of them, uh, and we will get to them near the end. Uh, and now I have the pleasure of introducing our authors. Uh, Sidura Ludwig is the author of a novel called Holding My Breath. Her short fiction has been published in numerous literary, numerous literary journals and anthologies, and her creative nonfiction writing has appeared in several newspapers and on CBC Radio. She works as a communications specialist and creative writing teacher, and is currently completing her MFA in writing for children and young adults through the Vermont College of Fine Arts. Sidora is originally from Winnipeg, but she now lives in Thornhill, Ontario. And Maria Reva was born in Ukraine and grew up in Vancouver. She has an MFA in fiction from the Michener Center at the University of Texas. Her work has appeared in Best American Short Stories, McSweeney's, and Granta. She currently lives in Vancouver, where she also works as an opera librettist. Welcome to you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so I think uh, we'll have Sudura is going to read first from, from her book. Sure. Do you want to okay. take it from here? Sure. Um, hi, thank you for having me. I'm going to read uh, from my book, You Are Not What We Expected. And I'm going to read from the beginning of the story called The Elaine Living Club. 
Isaac eats a cereal called Harvest Fiber Plus, the one that comes with dried blueberries that taste like jelly beans trying to have blueberry flavor. The taste is so sharp, it settles beneath his nose. If he were to eat a handful of those so-called blueberries, he would get nauseous. But sprinkled amongst his bran flakes and maple oak clusters, it's just enough of a treat to feel like he's cheating at breakfast. Isaac has a bowel movement before 8.30 a.m. every morning. That's how he knows the cereal is working, everything in moderation. Since he moved back to Toronto, his sister Elaine has offered to do him little favors here and there. She's smart. He knows what she's up to, looking after him so that he'll stay. She calls him in the morning and she says, I'm doing a Costco run. Do you want me to pick you up any of that cereal you like? He has plenty already. There are three unopened boxes in his closet because Sobeys had it on sale last week. But still, he'll say, sure, pick me up a box. In L.A., no one ever, op no one ever called offering to do him a favor. Elaine doesn't frame it in this way. She tells him, I'll give you the box tonight when you come to watch the kids. She's weighing him down here in boxes of organic flakes, and he doesn't even care. Elaine is meeting her doppelgangers tonight, her Elaine Levine Club, a bunch of senior women who like to get together because they happen to have the same name. When Isaac comes into the house, he smells his sister's rose perfume. Their mother used to wear a similar scent when she would go out on a Saturday night. Isaac is dizzy from the memory of her sitting at her vanity, the scent lingering around her like a cloud and floating slowly toward him as he stood in the bedroom doorway. As Elaine now rushes down the stairs, Isaac sees his mother, her scent billowing behind her legs like a wave, reaching for her stole over the banister. He blinks and she's gone. It's just Elaine waving at him as she applies her lipstick in front of the hall mirror. She purses her lips together and then relaxes them into a smile, leans in to check her teeth. Thank you. Thanks, Adora. Uh, and Maria. Okay, hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so this is my book, Good Citizens Need Not Fear, and I'm going to be reading from uh, the opening story called Nova Stroika. The statue of Grandfather Lenin, just like the one in Moscow, 900 kilometers away, squinted into the smoggy distance. Winter's first snowflakes settled on its iron shoulders like dandruff. Even as Daniel Petrovich Blinov passed the statue and climbed the crumbling steps of the town council behind it, he felt the grandfather's 360 degree gaze on the back of his head, burning through his fur flap hat. Inside the town council hall, a line of hunched figures pressed against the walls, warming their hands on the radiators. Men, women, entire families progressed toward a wall of glass partitions. Daniel entered the line. He rocked back and forth on the sides of his feet. When his heels grew numb, he flexed his calves to promote circulation. Next, Daniel took a step forward. He bent down to the hole in the partition and looked at the bespeckled woman sitting behind it. I'm here to report a heating problem in our building. What's the problem? We have no heat. He explained that the building was a new one. This winter was its first. Someone seemed to have forgotten to connect it to the district furnace and the toilet water froze at night. The clerk heaved a thick directory onto her counter. Building address, Ivansk Street, number 1933. She flipped through the book, licking her fingers every few pages. She flipped and flipped, consulted an index, flipped once more, shut the book, and folded her arms across it. That building does not exist, citizen. Danielle stared at the woman. What do you mean? I live there. According to the documentation, you do not. The clerk looked over Danielle's shoulder at the young couple in line behind him. Danielle leaned closer, too quickly, banging his forehead against the partition. 1933 Ivansk Street, he repeated, enunciating each syllable. Never heard of it. I have 13, no, 14 people living in my suite alone who can come here and tell you all about it, Daniel said. 14 angry citizens bundled up to twice their size. The clerk shook her head, tapped the book. The documentation, citizen. We'll keep using the gas then, he said. We'll leave the stove on day and night. The stove offered little in the way of heating, 
but then Neil hoped the wanton waste of a government subsidized resource would stir a response. The woman raised her eyebrows. Then Neil appeared to have rematerialized in front of her. Address again? 1933 Ivansk Street, Kirovka, Ukraine, USSR, Mother Earth. Yes, yes, the woman said. We'll have the gas engineering department look into it. Next. Thank you. Ah, it's a very funny book. Um, so as I mentioned in the introduction, these are both books of interlinked stories, um, an increasingly popular way, uh, genre, I would say, these days. And uh, in effect, they're both ensemble pieces with no central protagonist. Um, neither book has the usual colon on the cover with stories or a novel, you know, after it. And I assume that ambiguity is, in both these cases, purposeful, because it's, it is actually possible to read both these books in either mode. Um, so maybe we could start with both of you talking about that decision. Um, did form follow function? Uh, did the demands of plot and character, or was it vice versa? And um, and what you found the specific challenges of writing in what is actually quite a, a, a difficult way, as you're juggling a lot of uh, a lot of people. Um, Sudur, do you want do you want to start? Sure. Happy to. Um, this, when I started writing this book, uh, I actually started it as a novel. And what happened was, you know, every time I would sit down and I would and I would write and I would have word counts that I wanted to hit or page counts or whatever it was. And um, at the time, my my kids were quite young, and uh, you know, so I was just I was juggling a lot, and uh, at least that's what I felt like. And anyway, one day I sat down and I looked at what I had written, and I, I think I had a document of about three hundred pages that was going nowhere, and it just felt it it just wasn't it just wasn't happening. Um, and I realized that at that time of my life, I was having trouble reading novels. And if I was having trouble reading novels, I was too tired to read them. I was probably not in the right frame of mind to try to write them. Um, and but I, you know, I, I've 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 written all my life, um, and and I've always loved short fiction. And it's not that I find writing short fiction to be easier. It was just at that time what I felt I could contain in my head in terms of storytelling. And so I reframed the way I was working. I was still, it was the same characters and, and, um, and the same relationships, but I decided to, to try to reframe it in terms of a story. And what that allowed me to do was to dip in and out of these characters at different periods of their life. Um, but then it also, at the same time, I was really interested in, in this community that I have, you know, found myself now settled in. Um, and when by using this format it also allowed me to dip in and out of the neighbors and to start telling that story from a broader perspective um and so and so that that felt like that was really working for me um in terms of how how i was watching this story unfold how i was watching the the relationships unfold there was a lot more freedom in a sense in terms of where i could follow the story and where i could follow the characters um Isaac in particular, who's the um, who's the the great uncle that that comes back to help his sister out with her grandchildren, um, and so yeah, so so in the end, it was it it was both where where I felt that I could concentrate at that period of time that led me to the short story writing, but then it was also what I found the the, the format was actually allowed me to look more broadly at the story that I wanted to tell. Maria. Thank you. Uh, for me, uh, the I didn't know I was setting out to write a story collection. Um, I just had my one story in Nova Stroika, the one I, I just read from. And I kept wondering uh, about the other tenants of this building, that this building that does not exist. Uh, I kept wondering what were they up to in this difficult historical period? Um, how are they surviving it, surviving it or thriving inside it? So for me, it, it kind of felt like I was walking through this building, room from room, suite from suite, um, turning on the lights um, as one story became two stories, became three stories. And I knew they had to be linked because these neighbors are all linked. Uh, the physical structure of this building makes sure that they're linked. Uh, the walls are really thin so they can hear each other. There's heating vents so you always know what someone else is cooking. They live in a pretty cramped way. So as suspicious as everyone is of each other and as much as they try to stay out of each other's way, um, 
they, their lives have to intersect. So I knew these stories had to be connected. Did you ever think it was going to be a novel? You know, I, I did not. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, because when I was visiting these different suites, I mean, these characters always thought that they were the protagonists of their own worlds and of their own stories. So I had so many protagonists that, um, like what Sajira was saying, creating that community um, meant, I think, writing a story with many protagonists rather than having to choose one. Yeah. Does, does it involve, for both of you, building like a wall of crazy? Like, how do you actually map it out? <laughs> do you have the red thread and the pins? I, I had a lot of different maps going on um, and, and timelines. I worked a lot with timelines because um, I, I needed to see where everything was hanging. And also it took me a long time to figure out the um, just the structure and the order that I wanted to tell these stories. It actually didn't end up making sense to tell them chronologically. There was certain information I wanted to have at the beginning and at the end. And so, and then weaving them in and out when there, there is one main family that we follow through, but they don't always feature in the story. So how did I balance that as well? Um, that, uh, yeah, so, but it was, it was timelines. It, it wasn't like, you know, the, the big Bristol board map for me. <laughs> Maria, did you do something similar? I um, I drew a sketch of the building uh, and I had to <laughs> put where everyone was living so I could have a better understanding of uh, how they related to each other in their physical space. Um, and then when I had a draft of all the stories, I had this big, uh, I guess you could say diagram uh, or brainstorming sheet where I mapped out every story and I, um, I made sure to note down any details of each store. So any geographical details or how much of it was set in the building, how much of it was set in the store, for example. Um, and if, if they hear any sort of news snippets from other neighbors, so how would that relate to the other neighbors? So yeah, there were a lot of arrows and lines for sure. That's great. Yes. Well, you didn't get down to duct work and, you know, <laughs> pipes and <laughs> the engineering <laughs> levels. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, with a with a tip of a hat to our theme, which is entanglements, as you know, I wonder if you could talk about these communities that you depict in your books, um, and what your own specific entanglements are with them. Um, I know, uh, Maria, you are originally from Ukraine. I'm judging by your accent that you left quite young, but yes, so you seven years old. Yes. Okay. Um, and Sadura, you, as you just said, live in this Thornhill. Uh, primarily Jewish community. Uh, so maybe you could talk about what your relationships are to these communities that you depict and how long, you know, what, you know, how, how entangled you are with them. Um, Maria, do you want to start this time? For sure. Uh, so this building was inspired by the building I lived in. Uh, so it's first winter, the heating didn't turn on. So my dad was the one who had to go on this bureaucratic goose chase trying to prove that it existed oh, to the wow. authorities. That was real. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe yeah, it. Yeah, that's real. And it really was because uh, this building was built out of leftover construction materials. Um, so it just, it was never put into the records or into the maps or the plans. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, my dad had quite a time trying to prove this building's existence. Um, so he, when he told me this story, I knew that it was ripe for something and had to be fictionalized. That's how the book came came around. But uh, so yeah, I felt a very direct connection to this building. Um, I didn't know any of the neighbors. People didn't really talk very much in that building. Um, so I had to imagine them. And that was the fun part, I think, imagining all the things I didn't know about that building. And and so the people in the building, are they based on, I mean, if you grew up here in Vancouver, are they, and you know, are they based on talking to your parents? You know, have, did you take trips there when you're older or how, how did you come to know them? Yes, uh, yes, so talking to my parents and uh, grandparents and uh, I go back to Ukraine uh, every few years and I always make sure to go back to that building kind of as my own little pilgrimage. Uh, I don't go inside it or anything. I just look at it to make sure it's still there. <laughs> um, so those stories, uh, the, yeah, from, my own research uh, from family history. Uh, for example, the Ermine Coat story, uh, my, my parents were really did make fur coats for the black market. Um, and I read a lot of Reddit threads as well uh, for that kind of 
ordinary person's perspective on that time period. There are threads with thousands and thousands of comments um, about what it was like to live during that time period. And the reason why I chose Reddit was because these aren't historical figures who are talking. These are regular people. So right. I wanted their perspective. Hmm. Oh, that's great. Um, so, Sadura, you, you moved to Thornhill and now you ready. How, so how long have you been there? And, and, and so we've uh, been here. Um, it's 13 years next month that we moved into this house. Um, I, like I, you know, like you said, I grew up in Winnipeg. Um, I've, I've lived in a number of different places and for various reasons, we, we landed here. Um, and, and I'm so, and, and we're settled, like, you know, this is, this is, this is our home and, and we're, and, and we're happy to be here. And, um, in, but but I'm but I still feel like I'm uh, I'm I'm tr transplanted I guess you know and maybe that maybe one always feels that way when you when you grow up somewhere else and then land somewhere else and so um, so I'm both I'm both very connected you know in in terms of in terms of the community that I live in very involved in terms of the Jewish community that I live in um, and and with my kids and and their schools and you know and, and all of that kind of stuff but at the same time I also feel like I'm um, I'm, an, I'm an observer um, and I'm, I'm watching, you know, what's around me. Um, Maria, something that is that I found similar in terms of how we started our books, you were talking about the building, you know, and, and I love that first story. And I, I think it's fantastic that it was based on. So the first story in my book is about this man who marches into a school and um, and demands that they take down they've got the israeli flag flying below the the canadian flag and he's upset because that's against international law that actually happened the um my my main character is based on um is based on my my husband's uncle who's who's very uncompromising and and he did that and i remember when he came over and he was like he had to tell us this story you know about how he did this and i had the same response that you did which was that has got to end up in a book i've like yeah. you've handed it to me i'm sorry you know it's just yeah. um <laughs> For sure. but he's, yeah, but he's the only character that's that's really in well that character in my book is the only character that's based on um that's really heavily based on someone uh, that I know. The rest of them, the rest of them just came, you know, from different prompts and things like that that I was uh, that I was exploring. So did he actually have the shirt made out of the flag? Just like no, no, okay. no, 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 that, no, no. <laughs> the only part that really happened was he walked into the school and yeah. uh, and got into a fight with the principal telling them they had to take the flag down. Wow. Everyone's got a crazy uncle in their family. <laughs> uh, but I like the detail about the shirt that is made out of the Israeli flag and, and, and um, uh, the complaint that, you know, flag material is just not nice on the skin. Right. Yeah, <laughs> um, not meant to be worn. Right. <laughs> um, so did I, I have people Sorry. You read your book? Oh, stop flaunting your son. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the light changed and uh, now yeah, there's too much light in here. I'm so sorry. I'm flaunting my Seattle sunlight. Uh, well, hey, I look can't. at you well, complaining about too much light. <laughs> yes. the dark. Okay. Um, well, Sadir, I'll keep going with you. Has, have people in, in your community read? I mean, yours is quite a large community, yeah. I would think. Yeah. And yours is a horizontal yeah. community, unlike Maria's, which is a vertical one. But uh, <laughs> you know, have people, uh, you know, people read it, have they come to you and mm -hmm. given their thoughts? Because you know, not not all of your portrayal of this community is is flattering. It's um, it, uh, definitely people have read it. Um, it's a funny thing, though, you know, publishing a book during a pandemic, like I haven't had as much opportunity, you know, to uh, certainly not in person. Um, it's I, I, I knew that it wasn't a happy book when when I wrote it. Um, and and I wondered how that was going to land. Um, but actually, it while it's not a happy book, there it, it is a very humorous book. And a lot of people um, have seen either people they know in my characters or they recognize themselves. Um, and that's, uh, and, you know, so, yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, I've had some comments where, you know, people have found it either disturbing or it's made them think or, you know, or anything like that. Um, but, but that's, that's the way these stories landed. Um, and, and I think that, uh, and for, for the most part, no, for the most part, I've, I've, I've had a lot of, um, a lot of support, which has been really wonderful. There's a certain thrill in having your community make its way into a book as well. That yeah. people are very excited to see Thornhill. Yeah, and the good. landmarks, the landmarks. Yeah. So Maria, has your book? Is your book? I know you said you haven't gone to the building, but has your? Do you know if your book has made it in? Do do, do the do the uh, residents there have any idea that there's this 
this book floating around out there? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder about that. Uh, so it uh, has not been translated into Ukrainian or Russian. So unless they could speak English, they they uh, won't be able to to read it, which is almost like a relief. I, I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, but uh, I, yeah, I do wonder how people would uh, what what they would think of this book. Would would it be interesting to them, or would it just be a regular part of their lives, uh, just their day to day from that period? And maybe it would it, it wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> right. it, maybe it wouldn't be that exciting to them. I'm not sure. <laughs> Used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, one of the things I love about both these books is is your fantastic de declarative titles. Um, they're both is good. Good citizens need not fear again, and when, you are not what we expected. And I wonder if you could talk about um, about the titles, what they mean in the context of the narrative, and whose voice they represent, because they really do sound like these are their things being spoken. Um, Sidira, do you want to sure talk about that? Um, when I was looking at the the stories as a collection, and what what was what were some of the similarities or the themes that these characters were going through, I realized that each of these stories really represents a a period of change in the character's life. It doesn't have to be dramatic change, but it is a period of movement and a period of change, and a and a period of time that the character did not expect themselves to to find themselves in. Um, and so, so that was where the title came from. It is the title of one of the stories in the book, but then I realized that it really represented very much um, where, where all of these characters are landing in these stories. So that was, that was how I settled on it. And Maria? For my title, uh, so I realized that none of the story titles really worked for the book title. I didn't think that any of them really encompassed the book in itself while they were good for the stories individually, but uh, I landed on Good Citizens Need Not Fear because I thought that uh, illustrated uh, an attitude uh, of, well, the government, right, back then, uh, when they were watching the citizens, they, they would say, well, if you are a good citizen, you have nothing to fear from us, right? We, we won't punish you. You're, you're on our side, right? Um, of course, the problem is you don't know when you become a bad citizen, right? You don't know um, when the state changes its uh, its parameters, of its criteria of what it means to be a good citizen. And also this attitude of good citizens need not fear. I do see it a lot in in uh, just r regular people, um, people like you, you and me, when uh, we're faced with the question, do we allow the government to watch us just a little bit more? Uh, well, I have nothing to hide, right? So that's the attitude. Uh, and I just, I guess it's kind of like a warning. You, you have nothing to hide until somebody decides you do have something to hide. So. Right. Um, uh, and the characters in both these books, uh, another commonality is is a, a sense of um, that they're constrained by, by their circumstances and that in many ways they're powerless. Um, Maria, in your case, uh, with your novel, or your book, um, it's uh, it, bureaucracy is one of the main things holding everybody back. Um, and so your characters try to gain agency power through transactions uh, with other characters and sometimes through, for lack of a better term, compromise or digging dirt on each other, which is also a major source of the book's, you know, plentiful humor. Um, um, is, you know, was your decision to go with the strongly on the humor absurdist route with the book? Was was it to sort of mitigate that? Um, maybe you could talk a bit about how you know the, how these characters, the way they're trapped, and and how they manage to get themselves out of it, or at least to deal with it. Well, I think uh, humor. I think it's just the way I see the world, and it's how I was brought up in my family. We always make as these dark jokes. Um, when we feel powerless, uh, because I think we we feel like we can rise above our circumstances if we can make fun of them a little bit, uh, whether or not that's true, who who knows? But uh, it, it's therapeutic, and I think that was the attitude of a lot of our uh, family friends at the time as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And Sigura, <laughs> your your characters are are shackled in a different way. Um, for them, often the 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 source of this of their constraint is family history, it's the demands of religion, of old age, um, and a lot of them are quite alone in these quests. Um, you know, they're 
dealing with their lives. So I, and I'm wondering, you know, uh, if you see what the, the problems that these characters are facing are universal, obviously to some degree they are, or if, uh, how much of it is, is specific to, to this particular community? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, look, I, I think what's universal is this, is, is going back to the title, you are not what we expected. I think what's universal is we're all going to come up at points in our life where, where we, where, you know, where that wasn't, that wasn't what we thought was going to happen, whether it's 10 years, 15 years, a week, whatever from now. I mean, a pandemic is the perfect example. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, I was definitely uh, looking at or, or that, what, what, how does, how does a character find agency when they, when they're all of a sudden in, you know, potentially feeling stuck in, in where they are um, and wanting to, wanting to shift, wanting to make that shift. So that's the, what I, what I think is the universality in, in this kind of book, um, specific to this kind of community, certainly specific to these characters' experiences within this community and, um, and that, that feeling, you know, that feeling of feeling trapped or whether it's trapped by circumstance or, um, or trapped by the nature of, of choices that they've made. Um, so those kinds of things were specific to, uh, were specific to these characters and their experiences. Right. Um, and you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, uh, obviously, your books were written before it, um, but you know they they both do have the, the a sort of mood of claustrophobia to them. Um, these are all people who are stuck with other people <laughs> that they have to live with, whether it's family or not. Um, did uh, do you, you know? I assume both the books came out just after the lockdowns began and so I'm wondering if you had a sense when, when that happened if you were actually sort of in it living out your character's realities to some degree. Maria? Uh, yes when I had to line up at the liquor store uh, <laughs> I just thought of all my characters lining up during the Soviet <laughs> Union uh, so yeah having to line up for everything and um, uh, getting getting whatever you needed uh, or you didn't even think you needed it, but you might need it in the future. So you have to get it now. Otherwise it won't be there in the store. Uh, so that all felt very familiar. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Sidora? The, for me, it, it, you know, when, when the lockdown happened, the sort of the closest that we could get to getting out was going for a walk in, in the neighborhood. And I would say that I walk in my neighborhood a lot. Anyway, I've got a dog, I work from home, you know, that's that that wasn't anything new, but I was starting to see so many more people out walking, you know, and, and all these dogs, you know, and eventually it got to the point right where everyone got a dog. And so I felt in a sense, like, um, in terms of my lived experience of my characters, I wasn't getting into people's homes, but I did feel I was starting to see my my neighbors a little more and then maybe some of the other characters around my neighborhood a little bit more. Um, so yeah, so it, it it's funny that that sense of, of being alone or isolated because we're isolated in our own spaces, but yet all of us isolated together, each of us isolating in and of themselves. And I think that now that, I, you know, now that you, you bring it up, that's absolutely what was happening with um, with these characters, each of them isolated in their own personal experiences, but but isolating in and of themselves together. Hmm. It's book karma, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's our fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brought in on yourself. Um, yep. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to go to our uh, audience Q and A now. Um, one of the questions I have here: um, both uh, both authors were inspired by actual quote unquote real life settings, and I'm curious if Sadura and Maria have been have uh, read and been inspired by other books which are set in familiar territory. Uh, Maria. Yes, uh, one of the books that inspired me uh, is called Monday Begins on Saturday uh, by the Strugatsky brothers. Um, I really love the humor of that book. So it's kind of like a sci-fi Harry Potter in a way. Um, it's about this magical institute that's set in the Soviet times and whatever magical experiments they conduct still are constrained by the Soviet bureaucracy. Uh, so. It's really funny. That was a big inspiration for me for this book. That's great. Sidura? Um, I was, one of the big inspirations for me for this book um, was the book Olive Kitteridge by Elizabeth 
um, Elizabeth Strout, and I, I loved the way that, that that book also, by the way, did not have a colon, you know, novel or colon uh, short yeah. stories, but when I read it, I said, this is a collection of short stories and they're interlinked and it was an opportunity to see all of it from a number of different perspectives and that was definitely something I kept in mind as I was writing this or as my book began to unfold and, and I really wanted to be able to see Isaac in a sense from different perspectives. Well, that preempts our next question, which was Sedora. Yeah. <laughs> can you see it, the question? It, uh, I can't, yeah, I could see it in the chat, but right. I would have said it anyway, even if yeah. the question wasn't there. Uh, so you succeeded. Your book uh, reminded this this uh, question as well of, of uh, Olive Kitteridge. Um, uh, another question. Uh, I'm wondering if the authors could talk a bit about the editing process. Uh, were there any major revisions or cuts? Uh, and if, if so, if there's a part of your book that you missed the most? Uh, Maria? Yes, the editing process, uh, for me, it's always long and convoluted. So my stories go through these pretty wild plot evolutions before I settle on the plot that I would like. Uh, so for example, the uh, Miss USSR story, uh, which is about uh, a poet who organizes a, a socialist beauty pageant. That story initially started off as a story between a, a mother and a daughter who conducted uh, therapeutic bee sting sessions. Uh, and then it became a story about a girl who falls down a garbage chute. So it's still, uh, it sounds like totally different stories, but I just keep arranging, rearranging things like a Rubik's cube until I finally settle into something that is interesting to me. Hmm. So. Sadura? Yeah, my editing process is, it sounds actually pretty similar. My stories go through lots and lots of different drafts because I can just feel when they're not working. Often it's a point of view um, issue for me. I'm, uh, the Elaine Levine Club, for example, I went through dozens of drafts before realizing that I was getting the perspective wrong on that story and that I needed to be I needed to be telling that story from Isaac's perspective I tried it from Elaine's I tried it from a different Elaine's I tried it you know lots of different ways um, there was another story too it's called it's called Joy of Vix and I was inspired by a short story that I read I think by Neil Smith called Responsibility and in that short story in Neil Smith's story it's a um, it's a uh, a son and mother having a conversation in the kitchen and then the entire story takes place in that conversation in the kitchen. I loved it and I really wanted to try something. There was a lot of, I felt, you know, just a lot of tension and dramatic tension and in just, you know, in keeping in that one scene. So I kept trying it and, and it kept falling flat. Everybody who read it said, there's nothing happening here. <laughs> this isn't working. Um, and then, um, and then my mom and I both came down with the flu at the same time. And something, ha and something happened one day and I sat down and I decided I had that in my mind and I sat down and I tried writing the story in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. And it just flowed, it just flowed right onto the page. So the question is uh, whether there's anything I miss. There is, there's, I can very honestly say there's nothing that, that got cut or left out from this book that I miss because I do feel that by the end of it, I've, I've chipped away you know, to, to bring the book that needs to be right here. Um, and, and if there was something that didn't come into the book, then it's because it, it wasn't that wasn't working as part of the narrative um and so i'm um, i'm very happy in the end with um with the stories that i've got and it sounds like the viruses have worked for you in terms of yeah. the flu <laughs> help maybe the pandemic will help even more <laughs> yeah and I, I agree with uh, what what you said about the things you miss or didn't miss uh but yeah by the time the story is settled you just you've made all those decisions and you you just have yeah. to live with yourself right <laughs> yeah you come to terms with it you just come to yeah. terms with it and if you know yeah. they're like there's one story that very early on was in the, yeah i considered as part of this collection and and i only realized i only remembered it a little while ago and it, i cut it a long time ago because again it just wasn't working it doesn't mean that i won't ever do something with that story it just it didn't belong it didn't belong here uh maybe i could ask you last how um how your own lives judging from your bios, intersect with the work you're doing. Uh, Maria, you're a librettist, which is not exactly a dime a dozen sort of uh, <laughs> profession. Um, can we expect to see Good Citizens the Opera anytime soon? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> if someone would like to produce it, if there's an opera producer out there who would like to take it, yes, of course. I would be a, a very long opera maybe, but <laughs> with lots of characters. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's right. I do write uh, libretti for opera. It's like scripts for opera. And uh, that I really love doing that work because I find fiction writing pretty isolating. I'm just alone in my room with people in my head. It's not always healthy. <laughs> and when 
when my work is published, well, it's usually radio silence because, of course, you, you don't see the readers reading your work, especially now. Uh, you, you don't really get to engage readers right now with readers right now. Whereas with opera work, I love that it's collaborative. I love that other people get to put their vision into it. And I love that um, when you're at a concert, you can see right away if the opera has, if the scenes have landed or not, if it's going down well, which it's terrifying, but it's also thrilling. You get that feedback immediately. How, how did you get into writing libretti? So I have a bit of a music background. I played uh, piano for quite a while and uh, my sister is a composer. So I got exposed to a lot of uh, instrumental music through her. And I did something called Art Song Lab in Vancouver and they pair uh, writers with composers to create songs uh, for piano and soprano. And since then I've, I've been doing projects. Uh, I've been collaborating with composers since then. I've, I've been very fortunate, something oh, I really love to do. That's great. Um, so Dura, so I see you're doing an MFA in writing for children and young, young adults. This is obviously mm -hmm. not explicitly a YA book, although a, no. young adults could read it. <laughs> it's a, um, but it's, that's clearly not your target audience. So uh, are you actually writing books for children and mm -hmm. adults right now? Yep, yep. Um, I, I, my last semester, was uh, I was strictly working on picture book work, so I have a whole bunch of picture book manuscripts that I am mustering up the courage to start sending out. Um, and right now I'm working on a middle grade novel, historical fiction, um, so we'll see where that goes. I, I wrote a, uh, a crappy first draft of a YA book <laughs> that at some point I'll come back to. Um, and I love that, I, I love challenging myself this way. I just, you know, I, I'm, I love, I, I really want to be the kind of writer that's writing for a really wi a wide audience. And uh, so it's not that I'm leaving behind adult fiction to move into children's fiction, but more that I'm broadening, broadening my creative, uh, broadening my creative work in that way. Well, that's fantastic, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, one more. Th oh yes, I, I know what I wanted to ask you about, we were talking before about form, but also about um, constraints and breaking from form. And, and, and both of you in these books do some interesting things with, with form. Like uh, uh, Maria, you used little illustrations at one point and some diagrams in your book. And uh, Sidora, you, you um, experiment a little bit too with different sections. You write one in the style of Rick, uh, Rick Moody and another you write it as a series of drafts. And so you sort of break away from your own style. So in the couple minutes that we have left, I wonder if uh, um, you'd like to just comment on the, the freedom or not in, 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 in you know, breaking from expectations in those particular ways, Maria? Yes. Um... For me, I just, I realized that there were some things that I could not express purely through prose. So I needed to have those illustrations in there and those diagrams. Um, what I wanted to show uh, through the diagrams and the lists, because uh, there's a list of like can, canned goods, for example, uh, is that kind of double reality people used to live in, in those times where there was a reality that you're that the government wanted you to believe in and ah, our system is so great. You have all these canned goods at the store and we have such bountiful uh, produce. Uh, and then there was a reality that people were actually living. So I wanted to kind of juxtapose those two things with uh, diagrams from the government perspective and the prose from the real life perspective. Mm -hmm. And Sidura? For me, um, I think that one of the beauties of, of writing a collection of short stories is that you have the freedom to to play with form um and that when you know when you're writing a novel you you really generally have to stick with whatever that form is that you that you've decided the voice the that main character that's coming all the way through um and so you know as i was getting into these stories and i i really again it, it was part of it was a challenge part of it was what i was reading and what i was influenced by um and uh, and part of it too was was what what did the what was the story asking for in terms of to, how to be told so that well, that one story you were talking about with um, written in the different drafts it was that was because we were following the how a story comes it's a verbal story but how that story gets to be told as it goes from person to person to person and so much of you know the way the story gets passed down is like the editing process um, and it shifts and changes as different voices come in and so I felt I wanted to reflect that in the form in the in the written form as well. That's great. And on that note, 
uh, we come to an end. Um, I want to thank both of you, Sadura and Maria, for this chat and for sharing your work and your insights into it uh, with us. Um, and thanks also to everybody watching at home. Um, I also want to remind you that links to buy both these books are available on the festival webpage, courtesy of the University of Toronto Bookstore, um, the exclusive online bookseller for this year's festival. Uh, and to, and that to learn more about TIFA events, you can follow the festival on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, you can also join the festival's mailing list. So on that note, thanks again, and goodbye to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.